Hi there, it's Dr. Coates. This is my house again. Uh, as I as I said on email, um, I was rec I'm recording this a lot later than I usually do uh, because some of my other obligations intruded on uh, the time I normally spend with all of you. And I guess because the sun has gone down, it, it, it appears to be extremely dark in here. Although I have all the lights on in my family room. Um, also, if you hear uh, some strange noises in the background, that's because my dog Sybil is right next to me. Hi, Sybil. You want to say hi to the, the folks here? Hey there. Yes, you're smelling. Okay. Well, um, thank you again for your indulgence. Uh, I, I promise not to do this this late again. Um, at, at least is, is um, to the extent that I can avoid having this happen again, I will endeavor to do so. Um, okay. Uh, today's lecture, this is the, uh, the 28th of March, uh, and the title of, of the talk I'm giving you right now is called The Inhuman Sublime. And I hope by the end of this to explain what I mean by that. Uh, so anyway, when last we left off, I gave you three ways of thinking about poetic motives behind personification, which after all may seem like an unnecessary step for somebody writing a poem. Uh, it's natural for human beings to look around them and to try to interpret their environment, but it isn't necessarily true that the easiest way to do that is to populate the universe with human emotions and thoughts where none exist. Uh, and as for the practice that Elizabeth Bishop undertakes in, in her prose poems, Rainy Season Subtropics, well, poetry is a genre by many accounts designed for intimacy of expression. So projecting a poet's human voice into an anthropomorphic mask is a bit of an odd choice when you consider that other human beings are readily available as personae. Um, so why go to animals is an appropriate question to ask at this stage. So the three motivations for personification that I talked about on Tuesday were one, to use animals as a foil to explore and question human actions. Two, to illustrate the limits of human comprehension or understanding. And three, to imagine what life looks like when we are someone else, as if that were possible. Okay, I'm going to add a fourth one at the end of this lecture, but before that, let me just uh, clarify. I know that was at the end, you know, it was a little bit quick. Um, so I'd like to clarify what I meant by those first three. Uh, the, the first of those motives, you know, to use animals as a foil to interrogate human behavior, um, is relatively straightforward. And the next two are slightly more complex because it's all about stopping being yourself, which is kind of hard, you know, just fairly paradoxical uh, to think about doing. Um, but they're still related to the first because all three of these motives are based on the concept of humanism, the ultimate valuation of humanity and its products over other forms of life. Not that this is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, after all, studying poetry is, you know, the, the study of poetry is another way of, of valuing the products of, of uh, human consciousness, right? And it's not as though you're saying, when I study poetry, I, you know, uh, explicitly say that poems are more important than trees or something like that, um, right? But on the other hand, it's related to it. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Humanities courses in college are all based on the presumption that human beings are worthy of study, and I would say, you know, we are for the most part. We're interesting, you know, people. We're interesting living things. Uh, more interesting than rocks, I think. Geologists might disagree with me, but that's why they're not in the humanities. They're in the sciences. Okay. <laughs> uh, but like most ideas, it can be taken to the extreme. Humanism can. And if we take it for granted that the needs and desires of human beings are always going to be more important than those of other living things, or the ecosystem as a whole, the environment as a whole, we can short-sightedly blunder into situations in which human beings are indirectly physically hazarded. In other words, if given a choice between the health and well-being of a person and that of a mosquito, a humanist would always choose the person. And I think all of us would agree, all of us listening to this, I guess, would agree that the person is going to be more important than the bug. Or at least I hope no one is going to arrest me the next time I kill a mosquito as it's biting me. Uh, but how far would you take this distinction between human beings and other living things? What if we substitute a kitten for the mosquito or a cute little bunny? <laughs> what if we weren't talking about a life or death situation, but a situation having more to do with convenience? Um, in environmentalist discourse, as some of you probably know, the automatic assumption that human beings are always licensed to do whatever they want with the environment is called the dominant paradigm. And it has led indirectly to the extinction of many animal species and fairly unsafe business and industrial practices like strip mining or clear cutting of rainforests for the sake of maximizing profits rather than treating resources sustainably. 
Uh, and this is what I implied earlier when I was talking about a matter of convenience, right? Um, you know, you can go into a mine or you can take a whole mountain top off. Um, and not only does this destroy the environment, but it also endangers human beings that live downstream from where that, that mountain was strip mined. So I don't mean to suggest that your, your uh, favored humanities professors are advocates of clear-cutting in Brazil. But I do wish to implicate the dominant paradigm with an extreme form of humanism. Humanism unchecked by some understanding of human beings' responsibilities to themselves and to other living things and the environment as a whole. Um, is a, you, know, it's, you have to have some sort of tempering of humanism. You can't just only care about poetry and not at all about what that bulldozer is doing. So the pathway to becoming a responsible steward of the environment while still believing in the innate supremacy of those with consciousness over those that lack it is sympathy. And personification is perhaps our best example of such fellow feeling, this sympathy for animals. Uh, I am often torn between gratitude that a record exists of human beings' collective attempts over time to imagine the plight of animals, and scorn for the hollow and self-serving ways that poets have done this over the years. She's got a bone. For the attribution of human characteristics to animals is always ironic. Because they are not human and only have human characteristics to the extent that human beings fictively ascribe human characteristics to animals. And I know that was kind of complex, but, I mean, look at Sybil. You know, she's a cute dog. She's not really thinking anything. I would love to think that she is sometimes, especially when she's doing something that I like. Like, if I say sit and you sit. You're not going to do that now, are you? <laughs> okay. Anyway, anyway um, I would like to think that she's a person, um, but it's probably not. It's, it's not the case. Um, sympathy only ever flows in one direction. We can consciously imagine what our pet dogs might be. Hang on, got to flip the next page. We can we can imagine what our pet dogs might be feeling, but they cannot conduct thought experiments, and so they have no clue what we might be thinking. Note: sympathy is very different than empathy, which is an emotion felt equally by two living things simultaneously, and which dogs and some other domesticated pets have in abundance. Not cats. Cats have no empathy. I don't own any cats. <laughs> They'd rather rip your eyes out than, than love you. Um, well, you can probably disagree with that if you like. Uh, my parents have three cats, so they, they, I know that they would. Anyway, sympathy is a voluntary mental exercise. Empathy is irrational and reflexive, and so there is a distinction to be made between those two things. Okay? Uh, even if a poet tries to depict human traits in an animal as a means of praising it, the praise is really for the human trait at the expense of the animal. Oh, oh that was gross. Um... <laughs> At the beginning of Marianne Moore's uh, awesomely weird poem, he digesteth hard iron. Okay, stop licking the tablet. Um, for example, the speaker praises the ostrich, which is the subject of the poem, as a symbol of justice. If this is so, then the ostrich is only a symbol of justice for the human observer. The ostrich has no way of acting as either a hero or a scoundrel. Uh, those terms only have meaning for those who can be punished for yielding to base desires or praised for achieving the standard of admirable behavior. That's only people. Okay, now she's kicking me with her paw. Okay. Uh, likewise, later on in the poem, the speaker notes that, and here's a long quote, this bird watches his chicks with a maternal concentration, and he's been mothering the eggs at least six weeks, his legs their only weapon of defense. And it goes on from there. Which, of course, is quite progressive gender politics. Look, it's a, it's a, it's a daddy who's caring for the eggs, not, not just leaving it up to the mother. But no, wait, it's absurd to talk about a feminist ostrich. <laughs> Um, I mean, there are female ostriches, but, I mean, it's absurd. They don't even have consciousness, much less ideology and constructed identities and politics and things like that. Actually, and here I'm bringing some historical context on you, the kind I wouldn't ever expect you to produce on an exam, uh, if you consider that this poem was published in a magazine called the Partisan Review in fall of 1941 during World War II, there's a way of seeing the ostrich as a figure for Allied soldiers in the conflict, who put themselves purposefully in the line of fire to protect the vulnerable and the weak in their home countries, and whose heroism is not tied to their personal survival. The last stanza talks about an Asian ruler who ordered many eggs on a whim for an omelet, and so some ostriches must have failed in their protective duties, which is the same thing as saying, since they would only relinquish those eggs over their dead bodies, they made the ultimate sacrifice. But if you then reconsider the title of the poem, an early naturalist, the, the quotation marks in, the, in which uh, an, are the mistake of an early naturalist uh, who thought that they actually ate iron for their, as their diet. This is not correct. 
Uh, it's not really all that far from the colloquial expression of eat hot lead. He digesteth hard iron for eat hot lead, you know, um, which is what you know you talk about uh, in, in terms of um, being shot by bullets. And so the metaphorical link between a heroic ostrich and a heroic soldier is perhaps a little bit easier to grasp. Um, but again, that's just the backstory behind that poem. It still operates via personification, but it's just one of those examples of using a, uh, an animal within a poem to stand in for human characteristics, or in this case, humans themselves. Even when poets are praising animals, their act of inclusive comparison is simultaneously an act of disruptive contrast. But by that logic, I mean, in other, in other words, in, in trying to get people and animals to be closer together uh, within a poem, it's also simultaneously uh, thrusting us further apart because, as I said, it's ironic any time we, we ascribe human characteristics to animals and you know, it only winds up reminding us of how different we all are. But by that logic, any personification which is devoted to making a sharp distinction between the lives of animals and the lives of humans may also bleed into similitude. It'll do the opposite. Like, you think you're making a contrast between you and that mosquito, but, you know, I don't, I don't know that actually such a poem exists, but, but anyway. Uh, but by doing that, um, you might also wind up showing that there's some similarities between it and you, uh, merely because you're both alive. Take Elizabeth Bishop's poem, Sandpiper, for example which is at least one instance of personification in every one of its lines. The poem ironically depicts the speaker's observation of a sandpiper, a beach bird that spends its time running in and out of the surf on many Atlantic beaches, uh, and which you may be familiar with. Um, I'm, I'm from the Great Lakes region. Uh, I'm, I'm from Michigan myself, and you can probably tell that from my accent many times. Um, and we call those plovers. And those are like freshwater versions of the sandpiper. So it's the same you know, modus operandi of running in and out of the surf, but um, different, diff slightly different species of bird. Here is the poem in full, and I'm just going to read the whole thing for you. Uh, the roaring alongside he takes for granted, and that every so often the world is bound to shake. He runs, he runs to the south, finical, awkward, in a state of controlled panic, a student of Blake. The beach hisses like fat. On his left, a sheet of interrupting water comes and goes and glazes over his dark and brittle feet. He runs, he runs straight through it, watching his toes. Watching, rather, the spaces of sand between them, where, no detail too small, the Atlantic drains rapidly backwards and downwards. As he runs, he stares at the, at the dragging grains. The world is a mist, and then the world is minute and vast and clear. The tide is higher or lower. He couldn't tell you which. His beak is focused. He is preoccupied. Looking for something, 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 Poor bird, he is obsessed. The millions of grains are black, white, tan, and gray, mixed with quartz grains, rose, and amethyst. As she gazes at the bird, the speaker imagines the ocean must be roaring uh, to the tiny bird. I mean, if, if she were him, it would sound like it were roaring, even though to her it just sounds like surf. Although, you know, because uh, being a human being, she's much larger and her ears can take in more. But the bird seems nonchalant about it all. He takes it for granted, as she says. The force of the water must seem like an earthquake to him. But instead of fleeing, he runs parallel to it, seeming fastidiously finical and awkward, as she says. And then the very telling a positive, a student of Blake, which I don't need to remind you, the bird is incapable of having read. As the poem continues, the speaker continuously inserts comparisons only she is capable of. The bird would not know what the hissing of fat sounds like, for example. His feet would not appear brittle to himself, only to her. Um, only a tiny animal would have his entire universe reduce, reduced to mist. Everything is mist, right? Because uh, he's surrounded in it, but she is not, uh, as the wave crashes in. And he is not confused by the oscillation of blinding surf and ultra-clear sand grains, uh, although she imagines that he must be. The speaker's attempt to imagine the sandpiper's perspective is so complete, in other words, that when she pities him and declares the sandpiper obsessed by his preoccupations, uh, with the multicolored grains in the last stanza, it is hard not to suppose that the speaker is obsessed as well. The poem ends with a catalog of the, quote, millions of grains are black, white, tan, and gray mixed with quartz grains, rose, and amethyst. And then it just ends. Imagine how different this poem would have been if she had cropped that last stanza back at, he is obsessed, or then added, I took my beach towel with me back to my Subaru and drove into the sunset. <laughs> right? Kind of like one of those things, well, he's obsessed, but I'm going home, that kind of thing. It would be a much different poem. She, she ends on, uh, Bishop, uh, or the speaker ends with just, you know, trying to see what the, what the bird is seeing. And, I don't know, I, I find it kind of an ominous ending. Identification has led to sympathy, 
and in this case, the observation of a bird who appears obsessed to its human observer has led to a sort of mini-obsession on her part. But if you are a thoroughgoing humanist, or suppose even if you are not, you will always find it hard to stop being yourself and to become someone else. Thinking about what it would be like to stop being you is not the same thing as projecting yourself into animals that will conveniently not care too much when you imaginatively possess them, because they don't know that you're doing it. There's nothing especially pernicious or morally wrong about imagining the lives of animals, but it is a trap to think that it's possible to do so without doing some damage to the autonomy of other life. And I might here insert a fourth motivation behind personification. We simply can't help ourselves. We look around and we see ourselves. That is, sometimes it must be the unintentional result of sympathetic inhabitation of inhuman perspectives that, being human, we don't have any earthly conception how to actually inhabit. I have no I, I mean, I love my dog, but I have no idea what it's like to be her, do I? <laughs> No, I don't. Um, so we imagine animals as people, because that's what we know. But in doing so, we still run up against the other, the inhuman, which is a scary thing, even when you seem to be operating under a controlled situation where the human being in the picture has all the power and should be in no danger whatsoever. After all, while animals may be strong, and here I'm talking about bears or tigers or something like that, they may be strong, and some are potentially violent, we have pretty good brains that can allow us to anticipate and protect ourselves against their strength and animalism. The sublime moment of terror and ecstasy, in other words, the inhuman sublime, arises not from the mixture of beauty and fear as animals are beheld, but from the suspicion that not as much separates us from them as we would like to think. In that small glimpse of the inhuman lies terrific dread, and it accounts for the sublime moment at the end of Sandpiper, just thinking about the Sandpiper's repetitive existence drags the speaker into a glimpse of unending obsession, the kind that cannot be shrugged off and which goes on forever, or at least it would if she were that bird. Scary, scary stuff. But a fear of the speaker's own manufacture at the end of the day. So that is the end of the Inhuman Sublime. Next week we're, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I'm going to be calling post-humanism, or what other people call it too. Uh, and that is an, an attempt by human beings actually to move beyond the sort of humanist... Um, the prison cell of subjectivity, uh, the idea that we can never escape beyond ourselves. Uh, there are some methods that, that, that you can take in order to try to imagine, you know, what life is like after life stops, <laughs> or, you know, what, what it's like to continue on in some other form, or what it's like to imagine the world without human beings at its center. Uh, and we need to do that. That is the, the final step that we need to go through in order then to get to concrete poetry, uh, to the, the truly visual poetry that you've all been waiting for. Uh, which has its own image as its, as its rationale, and which doesn't really care so much about uh, the audience which is receiving it, but merely wants to, to appear in, in certain ways. All right, so anyway, that's where we're going. It's a bit of a preview of coming attractions. Once again, I apologize for the lateness of this, uh, this video. Um, and I don't know, if you like dogs, if you're just reading the transcript, I do encourage you to, to take a look at mine. She is really cute, uh, even if only to find the image of the dog and then <laughs> not to, to watch my slightly out of sync uh, moving face. Okay, have a great day, and I will um, be on Twitter, and you'll hear from me on email, and then I'll see you next Tuesday.